Hallelujah. I remember uh, one of the first times, actually the first time that I like really took in the Chicago skyline. Like not just driving in on I-90. I don't remember the names of the highways. I don't care how long I live here. Like, I don't know, Eden's, Eisenhower, whatever, old presidents got it. Um, <laughs> but I remember there was this moment, like we had seen, we had seen it driving in, but the RA at the school, Moody Bible Institute, took us all as freshmen and said, we're going to go and we're going to go somewhere special, but I need you to listen to me and like follow my instructions. And uh, so we're walking and we're walking to the planetarium. And if you've gone there, you know the view of the skyline. And he said, don't turn left this whole time until I tell you. So we're walking, we're walking. And we're like really obedient. I'm actually shocked that I was that obedient. Um, not looking left, like, okay, okay, it's, it's going to be worth it. And finally, we got to the spot, and he said, now, now you can turn and look. And it was like dusk, and you turn, and you see the whole city skyline. And just collectively, you're like, <gasps> like eyes wide open, mouth ajar, just like, it's amazing. And there's a feeling of like, this is mine, right? This is ours, this is, this is where I live. This is the place that I inhabit. And it was just such a, like, powerful moment. Out of my bedroom, I see the Sears Tower just a little bit. And I can tell you that very, very rarely, maybe never at all, do I actually, like, eyes get wide and mouth ajar looking at the Sears Tower out of my bedroom. Sometimes I look and I'm like, hey, this is pretty cool. There it is. Like, I like that color. Great. But it doesn't, doesn't capture me in the same way. Because sometimes the extraordinary, you know, like the, the, the unique and the special, the becomes ordinary. It becomes everyday. And it can slip into becoming mundane. You Google mundane and it says a couple things. It says it's dull, lifeless. The extraordinary, extraordinary, that which captured our attention, <gasps> becomes ordinary and can slip into becoming mundane. And I could go on with other examples. I think a lot of life carries this trajectory. A lot of life. And it's almost as if, church, that we have a foe who is determined for us to see the world around us and ourselves as boring and dull and mundane, and in so doing, see our God in that way as well. Because if you can blind someone from the extraordinary around them, you imprison them in a cell of boredom, apathy, and lifeless living. And then you try to coax them to other avenues of extraordinary living. Over here, this is where it's at. Over here, right? This is where it's at. And I don't know where you're at this morning, this Easter morning. It could be that you remember being awe. And now you're like trying your hardest not to yawn, right? <laughs> okay if you want to yawn this morning. But you remember when your eyes like lit up, you were delighted. And now you're just trying to keep your eyes open. Like, man, I'm just tired and I'm exhausted. I'm lethargic. Maybe this is an extraordinary Sunday for you where your shadows cross the door step and that doesn't often happen. And we praise God that you are here this morning. We don't think it's a coincidence that you're here with us celebrating Jesus this morning. Or maybe this is an ordinary morning. Maybe this is your regular Sunday routine. But my prayer, and I hope together, all of us, that we would experience this morning the risen Jesus, the only one who can wake us up from falling asleep, the only one who can take the ordinary and unite it with the extraordinary and who transforms the mundane into the majestic. And that's who we're going to talk about this morning. There's this story uh, after Jesus rose from the grave. Not a lot's written. 
uh, but there's, there's a few stories, and one of them's really, really comical. I was reading it, and uh, Jesus shows up in this room with the disciples, and he doesn't go through the door. He just phew, shows up. <laughs> oh, like, I defeated death. I can do what I want now, you know? <laughs> um, like, that's awesome. And like you and I, they're shocked and sort of incredulous, like, okay, what's going on? And they think that they have seen a ghost, someone operating under the jurisdiction of death, if you will. And he goes to great lengths. He says, no, like, look at my hands. You can touch them. You can feel them. Look at my side. Now, I'm, I'm flesh and blood. And then he says a curious thing. They, the writers didn't have to include this. They, they say this. They say, he asked them a really mundane question. Do you have anything to eat? I love it. I love it so much. Like, this is Jesus, the risen Jesus. Do you have anything to eat? And the writers let us know that they did, and they let us know that it was broiled fish. Uh, show of hands, who would be excited about broiled fish this morning? <laughs> Fair question, is David cooking? Mama, praise God. I am glad that you're excited about broiled fish. I like fish. But you put the word broiled in front of anything, and I have almost no interest, right? But the text says broiled fish in Luke 24. It's not behind me. You can go look later. Luke 24, broiled fish, and Jesus ate it in their presence. Super mundane moment. Really, really mundane. And it got me thinking about how Jesus in his life often took the mundane moment of eating and meals and feasts and banquets to teach extraordinary truths. And so that's where we're going this morning. We're going to talk about eating and food and, and stuff like that. And you're like, I didn't see this coming in the resurrection morning. But this is, this is what we're talking about. We're going to talk about four extraordinary truths that come from an ordinary meal. And in part, this was because after lunch last week downstairs, and we have these regularly, I just like walked away. And I like, just was so happy. And just so like, this is, this is, how it should be. I like couldn't quite put it into words. I just like kept thinking about the power of that moment. That got me thinking about the power of meals, and Jesus spoke about this. So the first extraordinary truth from an ordinary meal that I want us to take away is this. God wants a relationship with us. Maybe you've heard that a thousand times. Maybe this is the first time. God wants a relationship with us. There's this story where Jesus saves Levi, a tax collector, the person no one wants to hang out with, right? He saves him, and what does Levi do? He throws a big feast, and he invites all his friends, who are also like tax collectors, and the people that the, the religious folk don't like to hang out with. And they took issue with this, the religious folk did. They said to Jesus, why are you hanging out with scum like this? And he said a really curious thing, and something that should give us great hope this morning. He said, healthy people don't need a doctor. Amen. Sick people do. He says, I've come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners and need to repent. If you find yourself this morning in the category of a sinner, which we all are, if you know that, then... This is a great place to be. He's come for us. He's called us. But he hasn't just come and called and said, you know what, I want to save you from your sins just because, like, I want to, like, not really think about the problems that you're in. I want to, like, be distant from you. He came to sit at a table with us. This is what Jesus' life reveals. He didn't just come to be distant, like, I'm going to save you from afar. He said, no, I'm coming near to you. It means he wants to sit down with you across from a table and hear about your life share about his life. He's like, how are you? And we can think like, you just want to hear like real churchy words. Like, uh, justification, sanctification, sacrifice. And Jesus is like, yeah, this is amazing. Like, you're talking my language. Like, that's not who Jesus is. Those are beautiful and amazing, right? But he's like, no, how are you, Shannon? Rachel, how are you? I'm good, I'm good. Yeah, yeah. It's like, no, I'm not that sort of person in your life, right? Drew, like, I'm asking you because I want to know. I want to be in relationship with you. 
You ever be around people who, uh, they're like, yeah, we should hang out, and like, we should meet up, and we should this, right? And you're well aware of like, you're just, this is just a token, right? Like, okay, cool. And sometimes you're totally fine with it. Like, we're on the same page. We don't actually want to hang out. That's, that's all right, right? <laughs> like, just being, just being real this morning. Um, but other times, it feels a certain way. Because you're like, no, nah, I know I'm not good enough to be at the table across from you. I know you're not actually going to want to sit down and talk with me. This is just a token. And maybe that's what you think God is like. Maybe you think, like, he just, like, sort of says, like, oh, I really love you. And it's like, you don't actually want to be near me, close to me. And the extraordinary truth from the ordinary meal is like, no, I really do. I really want to sit at the table with you. Praise God. Praise God. The second extraordinary truth is this, that heart hygiene is more important than your physical hygiene. Heart hygiene is more important than your physical hygiene hygiene. There's this story. Jesus is at one of the religious folks, the Pharisees, eating. And they would traditionally like wash their hands, which we still do, but it was like more of a public thing, right? It was a, it was a, it was a ritual, a cleansing ritual, um, not just to clean their hands, but it announced like, hey, I'm a sinner and I need to, to, to be clean. A powerful symbol, right? And Jesus comes in and he, he doesn't do it just like bypasses that, sits down and starts eating. And they take issue with this, right? But whoa, hold up, hold up. Why aren't you doing that? Why aren't you doing the, the hygiene, right? And he says, you Pharisees are so careful to clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you are filthy. Oof. Awkward dinner conversation full of greed and wickedness. Imagine him looking around the house and it's all just like real fancy, you know. He's like, fools, didn't God make the inside as well as the outside? So clean the inside by giving gifts to the poor and you will be clean all over. This isn't like a, this is how you're saved, go give gifts to the poor, but it is also a powerful uh, expression of your faith right? Here's something that you can do in this moment as an expression of your faith in Jesus Christ. And I I don't know if you're like me, but there are certain places or certain people or or certain meals that you don't really have to, like, prepare hygiene-wise for. Like, any time of the day, if I want to go to Jimmy's, it doesn't matter if I brush my teeth. (laughs) It doesn't matter if those of you who are visiting Jimmy's, you can smell it as you go outside. It's the hot dog place two blocks from here. And they're, like, they're not particularly friendly. They're not trying to be friendly. If you ask for ketchup, they, like, scream at you. Like, it's a, it's a whole thing, and it's amazing, right? But point is, like, if I go in there, it doesn't matter if I've showered that day or week or month. Like, no one's smelling me. It doesn't matter. You just go. But there are other meals and there are other people and other times where it's like, man, I've got to, like, take some time, right? I've got to get my hair right. Like, text Jordan, like, hey, man, like, what do you think about this hairdo, you know? It's like, spot on, maybe more razor. (laughs) But you're like, it's more special. Maybe you're with your spouse or fancy folk, and you're like, i got to look good and smell good. And maybe that's how you feel like you got to come to to God, right? He's holy. He's perfect. Absolutely, 100%. But the extraordinary truth from the ordinary meal with Jesus is that he's like, no, I'm way more concerned about the heart. You could clean up and be all perfect and completely miss the sin inside of you. And you could be thinking, like, i got to get my life in order, right? i got to stop watching this and stop doing that and stop drinking this and stop taking that and once I get all that figured out then I'll come and Jesus will like be excited to see me. That's not the gospel. Praise God. We're never going to be clean enough for Jesus. Right? And he's not expecting that of you before you come to him. He says come and I'm actually the only one who can clean your heart. Because I could take all of that, took it on my son. He, he paid for that so I can give you a new heart. Right? This, is, this is how you do it, and this is what I want to do. Extraordinary truth. Heart, heart hygiene is more important than your physical hygiene. 
third extraordinary truth is this. Jesus celebrates our return to him. And we anticipate his return for us. Jesus celebrates our return to him and we anticipate his return for us. There's a couple different stories that I'm using for this truth. But you've heard probably the story of the prodigal son. Right, the son wishes his dad was dead because he wants the inheritance, gets it, and goes in a far-off land, squanders it, doing, doing real dumb stuff, and then he comes back. And you know the story, right? The father surprises everyone. The father who is, uh, who is God in the story. This is how Jesus is saying. And Jesus is sharing the story because the religious folk, again, are saying, why are you eating with sinners? Like, eating, why are you doing this? But what the father does when the son returns is he throws a huge banquet, throws a huge feast, kills the most special calf, the fattened calf. I don't know what they did to fatten it, but they were doing that for a while, for this moment. A powerful story to illustrate that when we return to Jesus, he doesn't respond with like, oh, I knew this day was coming. Yeah, now you're broke. Now you want to come back. Perfect. Let's talk cold table in front of you. You're like, let's talk about what you did to me. Let's talk about how that hurt my feelings. Let's talk about all that. that. That's not what the story says. He's so excited that his son who was lost is now fun, found. He just throws this huge party. And the older brother's like, what's going on? You know, like, what, what, he went off. He's like, he was lost. And now he's found. That's the heart of our God. When we return to him, he's, he's delighted. He said, there's more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who returns than 99 who are going about their way, 99 righteous. Praise God. But there's something also powerful in the meal, the ordinary meal. And that is that we are anticipating Jesus' return. Now, this is different. This isn't Jesus wishing we were dead, and he took, like, what little bit? We, no, this isn't that. And then he comes back to, this is him, Jesus, who ascended to the Father, right hand of the Father, is there right now, who's given us his spirit, who said, I'm going to come back. And they use this language in Isaiah 25, in Revelation, of this, this banquet meal, this marriage supper of the Lamb. And why is this important? Because when you and I eat meals with people, especially people that we love, there's often a, like, tinge of sorrow. Like, you might not even notice it. Sometimes, you know, if your loved one is getting older in age, you might feel it more. But there's just a tinge of, like, this isn't going to last forever. Like, my kids are going to grow up, and then they're going to go in the trades. It's like, <laughs> I at least want one of them to be a plumber. Come on, Jesus. They're going to go into the trades. We're going to normalize going in the trades, y'all, all right? They're going to stay in Chicago. They're not going to be that far away. But they're going to grow up. And it's going to be, it's going to be sort of sad, right? There's like this tinge of sorrow. I, I sit down with my parents and I'm just soaking it up. Parents, I know you watch online. Because I'm like, this isn't going to last forever unless Jesus returns. There's this tinge. It's sometimes barely felt, but it's there. But something about last Sunday when I was gathering and I was downstairs and talking with people and talking with Tasha and Charlene and talking with Isaiah and, and talking with all sorts of different people. And I left and it was like there wasn't a tinge of sorrow. It was just soaked with joy. It was just soaked with hope of like, now this is just a taste of what's coming. A taste of what awaits us when we as followers of Jesus gather together in the marriage supper of the Lamb. And it's not just, I don't think it's just going to be one supper and then we're like done eating. I, I think that's just like the beginning, right? We're going to be like eating in heaven, y'all. Jesus ate. He's like, fizzled, the broiled fish, it's amazing. Like, we'll, get the, we'll get there in a moment. Jesus celebrates our return to him and we anticipate his return for us. The last extraordinary truth from an ordinary meal is this, that Jesus has defeated death. We've said it already, right? But it's worth restating. Jesus has defeated death. 
when they saw him, right, in the room. And he's having them, ah, look, confirm, right? And he's eating this fish. He's doing something. He's taking that mundane and transforming it into the majestic. He's announcing, you're thinking of me of categories within the jurisdiction of death. The, the rule and reign of death, right? Oh, he must be a ghost. Like, ghosts, people have stories, right? This happens. Maybe some of you, like, you see some you're like, what? Within that, like, they just pop it. Like, what's going on? This isn't, like, real. Or what, what's happening? He's like, this is not within that category, right? This is not within the jurisdiction of death. And you might think that eating something so mundane and something we're like, we got to eat really good and try to keep our bodies healthy and like you can do all, do all of that. The jurisdiction of death is still going to take us down. And Jesus takes that mundane act and says, no, this isn't just like you just trying to stay alive a little bit longer. This is a, a real body in front of you who has burst through the jurisdiction of death and ushered in the jurisdiction, the rule and reign of life. Of life. Eternal life isn't just like a length of time, like forever and ever and ever. It's a, it's a quality of life. It's, the, it's like the God of life bursting through the jurisdiction of death. And you might be like me this morning saying, well, I don't know. I see a lot of death around me. We hear about it. We see it. We feel it. We experience it. And the truth is, is that unless Jesus returns, we will die physically. But the truth is also that for those who have put their, their trust in Jesus Christ, we don't die spiritually. We're taken to the Lord. But then it goes on, right? It's, sometimes we just talk about it like just like spirits, like you're just spirits up there worshiping all the time. This is amazing. And we forget the fact that there's a resurrection that comes. Jesus is, the, is the, 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 the firstborn of the dead, they called him. The one who... What? You got so many eggs. That's awesome. Emery, did you get a lot of eggs? Praise the Lord. Easter is amazing. The, um, there's this story in Acts 10 where the apostles are sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. And they worded it this way. They said, God, let me back up. We ourselves are witnesses of everything he did in both the Judean country and in Jerusalem, and yet they killed him by hanging him on a tree. God raised up this man on the third day and caused him to be seen, not by all the people, by, but, but by us whom God appointed as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be the judge, to be the judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that through his name, everyone who believes in him, everyone who believes in him, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. He's pronouncing that the resurrection, the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ, indicates that he is the judge. It is his jurisdiction, right? Of the living and the dead. Which says there's a day where we'll be before God. And what matters isn't all the good things that you did. And I was super generous and I was super kind. And it's not the bad things. Man, I just, oh. Did you put your faith in Jesus Christ? Not just a mental assent like, oh yeah, I believe this about you and I'm going to go about and do my, no, did you follow Jesus? Is he your Lord? Is he your Savior? And then the promise is that there is a resurrection from the dead. Like the grave, the jurisdiction of death, if you will, like there will be a day, whether you're cremated or buried bodily, you will come out of the grave. Imagine that, the grave, the one, what are you doing out of here? I'm part of the jurisdiction of life, get out of here. It's my day, like that's happening because we're made physical people to enjoy food and all sorts of mundane things. 
and we think that this has nothing to do with our faith. And Jesus says, no, that's completely opposite. These are ordinary things united with an extraordinary God. Fully God, fully man. Extraordinary. Who takes mundane moments, y'all, and transforms them into majestic moments. So I pray when we go downstairs and eat that you just sort of look around and be like, this is it. This is just a taste of what's coming. But in all of these stories, there's a, there's like a response that's called for, right? Those who repent in the first story, the return of the prodigal. And you think about a family meal, like how do you become a part of the family? You can't just like, hey, I just like really want to be a part of your family. Like, sorry, like you have your own family. You got to be born into the family. You need to be adopted into the family. And scripture speaks both of those things. It's, Jesus says, you've got to be born again, he tells Nicodemus. And Nicodemus is like, what? How do you be born again? Like, I can't go back into my mother's womb. And he tells him, like, God so loved the world. You know the verse, he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Have eternal life. That, that spirit, that God life. And scripture talks about the spirit of adoption that is given us when we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. That we're given the spirit that says, I'm part of the family of God. Part of the family of God. When the devil says, look what you've been doing. You're not this and you're not that. He says, I've been filled with the spirit of God. I'm a son and daughter of the living God. Get out of here. I'm going to enjoy this meal because I'm part of the family of God. And there could be some of you this morning who have never made that decision. You're saying like, I want to be a part of the family of God. I've got all this going on. I don't know. I've been really busy lately. And now's the time. This is the day the Lord has made. And scripture tells us, respond in faith, putting your trust, putting your hope, putting your, 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 your heart's affections, right? Say, God, you take it. Give me a clean heart. And our God is so gracious. He, he absolutely will. He'll be celebrating. Here you go. Let me take your sins and let me give you my life. So this is what I'm going to ask in a moment. We're all going to close our eyes and I'm going to pray. And if this is you, you say, man, I want to put my trust in Jesus Christ. I'm going to ask that you raise your hand. I'm going to keep my eyes open because it's, you don't just do this isolated. Like there's a community of faith, right? So we can connect and say, man, thank you. God is so excited. So I'm going to ask everyone, close your eyes. And if that's you, you say, today is the day. I've been going back and forth. I'm not so sure. I thought maybe this is how I would be right before God, but I've got to put my faith and trust in Jesus. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand and pray quietly. Or just pray, pray under your breath with me. Father, I have sinned against you. I believe that you have loved me so much that you have sent your son, Jesus Christ, who lived a sinless life and laid down his life for my sins and was raised from the dead so that I can be in relationship with you. Jesus, I follow you with my whole heart. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Amen. You can all open your eyes. Praise God. Praise God. He is so gracious. He is so kind. Praise God. But there's some of us in this room who have trusted in Jesus Christ for a long time. And it could be that the extraordinary has become ordinary and has slipped into becoming mundane. And there's a story in Revelation 3 where Jesus is speaking to a church and he says, you know what's happening? Your heart has become lukewarm. I wish it were hot or cold. This is lukewarm. I just like, want to spit you out of my mouth. And he uses this really interesting language. He says, see, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. That I want to be in relationship with you. you it's, this has become normal and just trivial and like not a big deal, dull. And I, I want this. And so here's my challenge. We're not going to bow our heads. We're not going to pray. But here's my challenge. If you're in that place, 
Rather than say, hey, I want you to make this decision again, this is my chance. Find someone, invite someone to sit down at the table across from you who you've never had sit down at the table before with you. It's like a symbolic act. It's like an act that opens yourself up to the grace of the Lord because we experience grace from one another. We're the body of Christ that builds itself up in love, right? And what it does is it humbles you to say, I need to receive a fresh and anew from you, Jesus. And it might be from someone who hasn't even been following Jesus that long, but the way they share their story, like, man, that's awesome. Or it could be someone who, like, man, you've been following Jesus so much longer than me. Thank you for persevering. That's my encouragement. Say, Jesus, I want to open the door to you. And what that's going to look like is opening the door to this person. Jesus rose from the dead. He is risen. He is risen. He is risen, church. He is risen indeed. The most extraordinary act in all of history, and he has united the, the ordinary, our human existence, with the extraordinary, the life of God. So that, beloved, we are not slipping toward the mundane, but are ascending towards the majestic. Would you bow your heads and pray with me? Father, we are so grateful. We are sobered, God, as we're reminded of who you are. And you're so unlike us. Your grace is so much greater than we could possibly understand. You love us in ways that make us uncomfortable. You love us in ways that we're like, I don't know if I'm that comfortable being that honest with you. And you say, I, I'll be here. I want to be in relationship with you. I, I want I to know you, God. And Lord, we thank you so much that you are alive, you are well, you are calling us to yourself, that you are preparing your bride, the church, for the marriage supper of the Lamb, God. We thank you that our ordinary mundane meals, God, are tinged with joy, soaked with joy. Soaked with hope, God, because of who you are and what you've done, God. So we respond in faith to you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, we are not done this morning, church. As you can see behind us, we have a baptism up. Because this morning is a super special morning. We are celebrating the baptism of Alex Johnston this morning. But before I invite him up, yeah, yeah. I just want to real quickly explain baptism, real quickly. Baptism doesn't save you. This isn't an act like Alex isn't saved and he's about to be saved. No, 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 that's not, that's not how this works. But it's a powerful step of faith. It's the obedient response to being saved. And it's something that we call, we'll, we'll call it like a sacrament. It's a visible sign, you can see it, of a sacred reality. You see it and the reality becomes clear, like my wedding ring, right? You see it, you're like, that dude's married, praise God. Yes, I am, to Adria. I take this off, still married, right? But it's a sign of the reality. And it's also a sign of a, of a commitment where someone says, I'm following Jesus, leaving all else behind in the water, and I'm rising up in newness of life. I don't know if they still do this, but like on Facebook, when you change your status, right? All of a sudden, you're like, that person's in a relationship? What? That person got engaged? What? There's like a change that happens. It's an announcement. It's a public announcement. That I'm aligning my life with Jesus Christ, united with him in his death, his burial, and his resurrection into newness of life, into the family of God. So at this time, I'm going to invite up David Satello, who is the mentor of Alex Johnston. I'm going to invite both of you guys up. And future pastor David.